Maya and Jason, I thank you for the privilege and opportunity of preaching this glorious afternoon. There's a danger when you invite someone who's been on sabbatical and only preached once in the last five months. <laughs> Friends here at Islington and others who have joined us, I bring you warm greetings from your brothers and sisters in Christ, in Christ Church, the United Church of Canada, in Mississauga. For us at Christ Church, Jason's departure is a particular painful lesson in forgiveness and grief and grace. And I did momentarily consider preaching on Exodus 20, verse 17, and the sin of coveting your neighbor's music director. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been fun. <laughs> However, let me commend Islington United Church on its choice of new music minister. I know you have already had a taste of Jason's amazing talents in the last few months. The truth is you will grow together beautifully and wonderfully the next three decades in lockstep. <laughs> Jason has amazing musical gifts, extraordinary teaching, and relational skills. Your worship will be deeply enriched and enhanced through his leadership. He is a person of creativity, grace, compassion, humility, friendship, liturgical intuition, faith, warmth, and fun. Music ministry is his calling and his gift. You will have many, many good times together. And yes, in his partner, Jiwan, you also have an extraordinary musician and person as well. Yours to discover. Islington folk may not know that I have been on study leave with Maya, and at times we've been in non-competitive swim meets together. <laughs> and I know that the Spirit has brought two extraordinary people together in team. You are blessed, and you will be blessed. Taking a note from our Prime Minister, I will tell you that I'm wearing special socks today. <laughs> These are my Martin Luther socks for the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. The socks say, here I stand, I can go no further. <laughs> but the point in wearing them is that in May, I had the delight of worshiping in St. Thomas Lutheran Church, Leipzig where both Luther and Bach were in team together in ministry. And by the way, when they were hiring Bach, he was the third choice of the search committee. Mm. <laughs> Nobody knows the other two now. They only remember Bach. Anyway, you have an amazing team here. My encouragement is that you give them time to hit their stride and to make the changes that will bless your shared life in Christ. Jason will demonstrate the power and grace in the wisdom of the ancient psalmist who said, Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. You have called a gifted and gracious composer in Jason. At other times, you will be moved as Jason breathes new life into a well-worn piece, or into an overly familiar piece, or even into a piece that you once consigned to the indifference pile, the renewal of the old and overly familiar. It is a gift. Jason's compositions and choices of music will take you new places spiritually. 
Was it Dr. Seuss or the risen one in Bethany before his ascension who said to us, oh, the places you will go. Oh, the places you will go. Simply through the selection of hymn tunes, you will come to Munich and Madrid and Miles Lane and Cape Town and Regent Square and Tokyo and Richmond Hill. Yes, there's a hymn tune called Richmond Hill and Westminster. It just may be, as Jason continues to compose, that you will sing Islington, Etobicoke, Burnham Thorpe, Humber River, and the Ford Nation Blues. <laughs> oh, the places you will go. More importantly, he will take you to the cleft in the rock, to the churning of the Red Sea, to a tiny stone house in Nazareth or a cave in Bethlehem, to the ever spacious and voluptuous Galilee, the bubbling of Jacob's well, a bare hill that bears a cliff face of a skull, a hand-hewn borrowed tomb, an upper room with locked doors, a spirit-filled city square, and the holy city. Oh, the places you will go. He will take you to the throne of grace and the seat of mercy, to the divine baggage carousel where you can drop your burdens. He will take you to the door of the healer's home, and to the beating heart at the center of life. The beating heart at the center of your life. Jason also grew up in the Salvation Army. And he will also take you to haunts of wretchedness and need and shadowed thresholds dark with fear. A few moments ago, we listened to familiar words from St. Luke. Yes, I do know what season it is, and my sabbatical hasn't been that long. <laughs> this gem is overly familiar. We read it, and we are most often focused on the holy birth and the gift of the Christ child. But I want to remind us that there is a wonderful pairing in this scene. The proclamation of this birth is followed by glorious praise. And suddenly there was with them a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom God favors. The announcement leads to praise. The good news of the inbreaking of God is paired with a chorus of praise. Every announcement of the inbreaking of God, every hint of the nearness of God, every sighting of the grace of God, every twitter about the creative meddling of God, every alert to the wisdom of God, every text about the justice of God, every whisper of the compassion of God should be paired with praise. And week by week, this pairing will shape your life. Your shepherding pastor, Maya, will announce and proclaim and whisper words and stories of the inbreaking of Christ and you have the joy of responding in song. Your musical response may be unrestrained joy, self-critical lament, gut-wrenching sorrow, rivulets of compassion, tiptoed anticipation, 
or tears of gratitude. Strangely, this ancient pairing is ever new. Each time we live into it, it sustains us, it shapes us, it blesses us, it brings us nearer to God, and we breathe into ourselves the good news unfolding among us. We breathe into ourselves that tender grace that renews our lives. I think the writer of the Ephesians somehow understood all this and yet says in the verses we shared, the days are evil. Must have been reading the Toronto papers. The days are evil. We're prone to think that these days with bombings in London, international tensions, horrendous hurricanes, and all kinds of other little bits of evil. When we say the days are evil with St. Paul, some will dismissively say, so what else is new? And yet, does it not feel like certain values and institutions and well-tested practices are under siege? Truth and facts seem under siege. We may watch and wonder if America is going to spiral out of control or into civil unrest. We stress as egotistical men with weird hair play with their missiles, are engaged in one-upmanship and escalating rhetoric. And it's not just some world leaders that are overheated. Our planet is reacting. Climate change judges us and finds us wanting. And strangely here in Toronto, for others of us, it's the best of times. It all depends on where you are on the social and economic ladder, your gender, your orientation, your hue on the color spectrum. The writer to the Ephesians wants us to think about what is particularly evil about the ways we spend our days, how we use our time, how we waste our time, how we abuse our time, how we abuse ourselves and our bodies. Interestingly, while we may think of world events, the writer of Ephesians, when he says the days are evil, has in mind a rather unimaginative brand of evil, drunkenness, debauchery, fornication. But this evil is symptomatic of a confused, disordered, pointless reeling from one mistake to another. He's talking about foolishness. Such is the time in which we live, where these behaviors and more are not just brushed off as normal, but actually celebrated and encouraged, wasting time in foolishness. <coughs> Let me make confession. I am fascinated by the shenanigans going on in Washington, fascinated and appalled. It's hard to keep up with, isn't it? And as a former journalist, I'm kind of angered by the attacks on the mainline media. My response is I get several news feeds, and my number one Google is latest Trump news. Anybody with me? <laughs> but it can gobble a lot of time. Let me suggest the invitation in this lesson is to make the most of time, which some would say is to keep busy and move fast and cram in just as much as possible. And in the church, we are often drunk with busyness. Making the most of our time can mean foolishly filling our days with harried, meaningless busyness, crowding our precious time with 
electronics and chatter and loud music, the sound of racing footsteps on hardwood and terrazzo, doing our best to get ahead in traffic, one more energy drink, one more dark roast coffee, so we have the energy for one more thing. And often, we are too busy to come to worship. Too much to accomplish. We get drunk with our sense of self-importance. Worship is seen as a, well, kind of a waste of time. It doesn't accomplish anything in many people's eyes. Our days are evil and pointless in so far as we are blind or is it numb to God's presence and activity among us. We make the most of time by keeping time with God. We make the most of time by being in tune with God. For this time is God's time. This time is God's time. So now and then we do well to step off the treadmill, step back from the busyness, pause the electronics to rediscover what is important, to possibly reorder our lives. Let me suggest that every Sunday is meant to accomplish some of this renewal. That's what happens to us in worship. When the days are evil, the writer to the Ephesians says, the very best thing we can do is to join with our brothers and sisters, past and present, to sing. Yes, sing. We defy this sad, sometimes cynical world by singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among us. Singing and making melody to the Lord in our hearts. When we do this, we hold the evil at bay. We remember who we are. We remember who God is. We remember what God has done and is doing for us. We find the peace that is God's gift to us when we sing. This is a perspective shift that is profoundly healing. The best antidote to these evil days is to break into song. The best antidote to these times is to break into song. So whether you are stressed about your job or your family or Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un, or Kathleen Wynne, whether it's the best of times for you or the worst of times, whether your to-do list is longer than your arm, whether your kids don't get it, or your forgetful parent in the nursing home says you never visit, whether you feel guilty about the foolish things you do and you can't seem to slow the pace of your life, Join your brothers and sisters in rip-roaring praise. Oh, the places you will go. Oh, the God you will know. You will find that you come to echo the psalmist. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom, of whom then shall I be afraid? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Friends, you will be surprised at the difference a doxology can make. You will find your time, this time, God's time, redeemed and transformed. And suddenly there was with a multitude of the Islington congregation praising God and singing glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom God favors. Now to the one who by the power at work within us 
is able to do far more abundantly than we can ask or imagine. To God be glory and praise in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen.